Good morning, everyone. Welcome to our chapel service at Fellowship Church Rouge Park. We're delighted and happy that you can join us today. Um, my name is Kesa Van Balasingham. I'm one of the elders at this church, and uh, we want to read in a moment our passage and pray. But prior to that, we want to do our uh, reading of ba wedding bands this morning. And last week, our elder Sam did it for the first week. Today is our second reading. So at this time, I want to announce the bands of marriage between Jason Selvanayam and Sharon Jerusika Jebaselvin of Fellowship Church Rouge Park. This is the second reading of the bands. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, please contact myself or our elder Sam and let us know. I'd also like to announce the bands of marriage between Roshan Danaraj Karadula and Deborah Elizabeth D'Souza of Fellowship Church Rouge Park. This is the second reading of the bands. If any of you know any reason in law why they may not marry each other, please contact myself or Elder Sam and let us know. Both of these couples have planned to be wed in August. And as a church family, we're delighted for them. And so I invite you to join us to pray for them, that God would help them to prepare and be fruitful in their marriage. And so today's passage, we're going to look at 1 Timothy chapter 2, verses 1 to 8. We're going to read that together and we're going to pray that, asking God to help us. So join me now as we read. First of all, then I urge that supplications, prayers, intercessions, and thanksgiving be made for all people, for kings and all who are in high positions, that we may lead a peaceful and quiet life, godly and dignified in every way. This is good, and it is pleasing in the sight of God our Savior, who desires all people to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. For there is one God, for there is one mediator between God and men, the man Christ Jesus, who gave himself as a ransom for all, which is the testimony given at the proper time. For this I was appointed of others, this, for this I was appointed a preacher and apostle, I am telling the truth, I am not lying, a teacher of the Gentiles in faith and truth. I desire then that in every place that men should pray, lifting holy hands without anger or quarreling. Let us pray. We praise you, that, Father, that you are the King of Ages, greater than any leader or governments. You are never elected, you are never impeached, you are never confused or wrong. We praise you, the immortal God who exists beyond life and death. And we come to you and we praise you that you were the eternal God when every good and bad times in history came and went. You are the still saving people who are lost and you will one day renew all things. We praise you, the invisible God who exists beyond all that we can see and even understand. Even when it appears that all is lost, you are at work as the invisible God. Lord, we want to worship you this morning as the only wise God, who is wise beyond all human understanding. At this moment, in our nation, we are trusting you as the only wise God to protect us in this pandemic and in this time of racial upheaval and hurt. Father, we ask that you would be the priority of our spiritual intimacy in the pursuit of Christ. We confess of the things that have taken priority over our pursuit of a consistent intimate relationship with you. Help us, Lord. Help us to daily seek you in our humility and confess our sins and inability. Father, help us to lead a peaceful, quiet life, godly and dignified in every way as we have just read in this passage. Help our hearts to never grow faint for the lost in our community and opportunities for the gospel. Lord, would you send a revival and let it begin with us in this city, and let it go forth through this nation and into the nations. We pray, Father, for all the families in the church. We pray for your protection against the work of Satan. We pray for healing, both physically, emotionally, and spiritually. We pray for your peace in our homes, and we ask that you would help us in our parenting. Help us, Lord, to be faithful and loving ambassadors to our children and to our neighbors. Lord, we're mindful today that you are the King of the Ages. You are immortal. You are invisible. The only God to whom belongs honor and glory forever. And so as we think of you, Lord Jesus, I pray that you would help our hearts to magnify you. We seek you because you're worthy to be sought. 
So help us to seek your face before we seek your hand. And so we also pray, Lord, that you would anoint your servant, Sam, as he preaches your word, that you would take that and you would speak to our hearts and our minds. May you give us understanding, may you give us conviction, and may you change us. May you bring new life, and may you bring renewal, and may you help us grow in holiness. That we would enjoy you, love you, and make you known to a hurting world. We thank you, and we praise you, Lord. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Good morning, church family. We hope you're doing well. Join us as we worship the Lord together.
my soul longeth after thee. You alone are my heart's desire, and I long to worship thee. came across an article online this past week and the headline read, Non-believers turn to prayer in crisis, Paul finds. The author of the article states that for many non-believers, prayer is an instinctive response to a crisis. Personally, I believe this is true not only for non-believers, but also for those who do believe. And the following, what I'm going to read, is a part of the interview, interview that's found in the article. Henry, 64, age 64, said he prays every night, kneeling by his bed. Despite not being religious, he says, I worry about it quite a lot. Is it some kind of insurance policy? Is it superstition? Or is it something more real? Asked if he believed in God, he said, I don't know, but I would describe myself as the skeptical, at the skeptical end of agnosticism. I certainly wouldn't classify myself as religious. Henry, who requested anonymity, starts by silently reciting the Lord's Prayer and then asks for his loved ones to be kept safe and well. Sometimes, 
I include other specific people or suffering groups, he says. Then I have a fuzzy moment about me, not concrete thoughts, and I don't ask for specific things. He said he had no idea if God heard his prayers and said the act of praying did not make him feel any better. He said, I wonder why I don't stop doing it. Sometimes I feel like it's kind of hypocrisy. Anyone can pray, but unless, but unless we know and enjoy the one true living God, we will never have confidence that our prayers are heard or will be answered. Our prayers become thoughts and words thrown into the wind. So today, let's look at a prayer written by a man who personally knew and experienced the God of all creation and see how he, he interacts with God and the confidence he is given as a result. So if you could turn to me to Psalm 5, and I'll start reading there, give you a moment to, to get there. Psalm 5 is a psalm written by King David. It says, Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Give attention to the sound of my cry, my King and my God. For to you do I pray. O Lord, in the morning you hear my voice. In the morning I prepare a sacrifice for you and watch. For you are not a God who delights in wickedness. Evil may not dwell with you. The boastful shall not stand before your eyes. You hate all evildoers. You destroy those who speak lies. The Lord abhors the bloodthirsty and deceitful man. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. Lead me, O Lord, in your righteousness. Because of my enemies, make your way straight before me. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their inmost self is destruction, and their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God, and let them fall by their own counsels. Because of the abundance of their transgressions, cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you, for you bless the righteous, O Lord, and you cover him with favor as with a shield. That psalm is usually is, is traditionally attributed to King David. And we're going to focus on this psalm and focus on three observations that I've made. The first, God has the greatest authority and he can help us. So we should call out to him and wait for him to respond or his reply. Second, those who trust in God are accepted by God and declared righteous because of God's steadfast love. And the third observation, the righteous should pray for guidance, justice, and blessing. In this psalm, David is appealing to God for help as he is threatened by wicked and godless enemies. Although King David was a powerful and successful king, he was not too proud to humble himself before God and cry out to him for help. And you could sense the urgency that David had in his appeal uh, as you read the emotion and how he communicates it. He intensifies it. First, he, com he comes to God with words, then groaning. And finally, in verse 2, it says that he cries out to God. King David had authority over a nation, yet he recognized that God had complete authority over all creation. God is the King of Kings. And King David acknowledges this by writing, My King and my God, for to you do I pray. Furthermore, in verse 3, David expresses his confidence that God hears his cries for help and his intentions to wait patiently for God to respond. O oh Lord, in the morning I prepare a sacrifice, or I lay my requests down before you. For you, for, and for you do I watch, or for you do I wait. King David sets an example for us. In his humble posture before God, and also in his confidence that God will hear his cries for help. This example teaches us that God has the greatest authority and he can help us. So we should call out to him and wait for him to reply. King David calls out to God in the morning at the beginning of the day 
according to verse 3. God is first on his list, and he does not hesitate to reach out to him. We also should not hesitate to reach out to God. Too often we try to weather life's storms on our own. We try to push through the troubles in our lives by our own strength and our resources. But dear family, the sooner we recognize that God is sovereign and in control of all affairs in his created universe, the quicker we will fall into his arms and cry out to him for help. Put aside the pride and call out to God. He can certainly help us. After you have called out to him, just like David did, just wait and he will respond. When we call out to God, he will respond in accordance to his holiness and steadfast love. It is a common occurrence to read or hear about God's great love. After all, the Bible does say God is love. But what about God's holiness? Unfortunately, some of us hold a distorted view of God when we do not consider his holiness alongside with his steadfast love. When speaking about God's holiness, the late R.C. Sproul said, only once in sacred scripture is an attribute of God elevated to the third degree. Only once is the characteristic of God mentioned three times in succession. The Bible says that God is holy, holy, holy. Not that he's merely holy or even just holy, holy. He is holy, holy, holy. The Bible never says that God is love, 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 or mercy, 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 or even wrath, 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 or justice, justice, justice. It does not say that he, it only says that he is holy, 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 and that the whole earth is full of his glory. Being holy means being set apart. God is unique. He is perfect and pure, so much so that there is no one else like him. He is set apart from everything and everyone. Everyone has fallen short of God's glory and his standard is perfection because he is perfect. There is no one who is righteous and perfect except for God. Because God is holy, he must always do what is right and good. And God's holiness demands that God hate evil. You see, God's love is perfect because he perfectly loves that which is good and perfectly hates what is evil. And he demonstrates this because he is holy. In Psalm 5 verses 4 and 6, we can read about God's holy attitude towards the wicked. Verse 4 starts, For you are not a God who is pleased with wickedness. With you, evil people are not welcome. The arrogant cannot stand in your presence and you hate all who do wrong. You destroy those who tell lies and the bloodthirsty and deceitful you, Lord, detest. According to verse five, the wicked are boastful. This means that they are arrogant people who exalt themselves over God. It means that they do not fear God and live only for themselves. They spew lies and falsehoods from their mouth. They deceive others and resort to violence for their own gain. They are worldly people who oppose God and say, let us break his chains and throw off his shackles. In contrast, verse 7 describes God's attitude towards the righteous. But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house. I will bow down toward your holy temple in fear of you. Unlike the wicked who oppose God and are cast out of his presence and destroyed, the righteous are given access to God's house and they humbly bow before his temple in fear of God. So how do we become righteous and acceptable to God if we ourselves are sinners? It is by the steadfast love of God that the righteous are able to enter God's dwelling and stand before his holy presence. Notice that David does not record his own righteous acts to contrast them with the deeds of the wicked. He does not attempt to justify himself as righteous. However, he does give us the reason for his righteous status before God. He says, as for me, I will enter your house because of your steadfast love, because of the steadfast love of God. 
King David has been accepted by God's steadfast love, a love which is poured out to everyone who trusts in the Lord. Those who trust in God are accepted by God and declared righteous because of God's steadfast love. Today, God's love has been shown to us through Jesus. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time, Christ died for the ungodly. Romans chapter 5, verse 5 and 6. We all deserve the fate of the wicked, and we are all unholy as sinners. We stand guilty before a perfect, holy God. The Word of God tells us that the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in who? In Christ Jesus our Lord. So how does God show His steadfast love and impart righteousness to the unrighteous? Well, we read, For God so loved the world that He gave His one and only Son, that whoever believes in Him shall not perish but have eternal life. Those who put their faith in God and His divine Son Jesus can approach God and have confidence that they are accepted by God because of His grace. God's steadfast love has been shown to us through the death and resurrection of our Savior, Jesus Christ. So in Ephesians chapter 3, verse 12, we read, In Jesus and through faith in Him, we may approach God with freedom and confidence. Again, in Hebrews, we also read, Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the most holy place by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way open for us through the curtain that is his body. And since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us draw near to God with a sincere heart and with the full assurance that faith brings, having our hearts sprinkled to cleanse us from guilty, a guilty conscience and having our bodies washed with pure water. That's in chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Brothers and sisters, don't be shy. Let's pray to our Father God with confidence, He can and will help us. You wait and see. And those who put their faith in Jesus and follow Him are accepted into God's house because Jesus has cleansed us by His blood and He has clothed us with His righteousness. So lift up your face and do not be discouraged. The wicked will be destroyed and the righteous will dwell in God's house and He will hear and answer our prayers. Although David had assurance and confidence before God, he entered into God's presence carefully with humility and reverence. Look at verse 7, it says, But I, through the abundance of your steadfast love, will enter your house, and I will bow down toward your holy temple in the fear of you. We must remember that the grace God has shown us is extremely costly. Jesus gave his life, shed his blood to pay the penalty of our sins and give us a new life in him. Therefore, let's always be mindful of the significance of being accepted by God as righteous, not by our own merit, but by the love and grace, the costly grace of God ultimately revealed to us in Jesus. Therefore, the posture we take when we come to God in prayer should be one of humility, thanksgiving, and reverence. Now let's look to the last portion of Psalm 5, specifically verses 8 through 12. Here, King David begins to articulate his prayer to God. I'm going to break down David's prayer into three, three um, requests. The first being guidance, then justice, and blessing. First, David prays for guidance in verse 8. Lead me, Lord, in your righteous righteousness because of my enemies and make your way straight before me. David asked God to lead him so that he would walk in the straight or right way, which is the way of righteousness. David is aware of the deception of his enemies and their crooked ways which lead to destruction. He needs God's help to stay on the right path. He cannot do it alone. Next, David prays for justice. For there is no truth in their mouth. Their, in, their inmost self is destruction. Their throat is an open grave. 
they flatter with their tongue. Make them bear their guilt, O God, and let them fall by their, their own counsel because of the abundance of their transgressions. Cast them out, for they have rebelled against you. Notice that God does not appeal to, sorry, David does not appeal to God because his enemies have wronged him. Instead, he says to God that they have rebelled against him, against you, God. In verse 9, he writes that there is no truth in their mouths. Their throat is an open grave, and they flatter with their tongue. Notice how the wicked use their mouth, throat, and tongue. They utter falsehoods that lead to death, and they lie for selfish gain. The wicked are guilty before God, and what they say is evidence of their darkened hearts. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. In all this, God is sovereign and he will let the wicked fall and he will ultimately cast them out and destroy them. Lastly, David prays for God's blessing in verses 11 and 12. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. For you bless the righteous, O Lord, and you cover him with favor as with a shield. In contrast, the righteous can take refuge in God and rejoice because God will protect them. David asked that God bless the righteous and that God's favor would be evident as a shield, a covering over the righteous. David ends the psalm in hope and expectation. Despite the evil and brokenness around him, despite the threats and accusations, despite all the lies, those who love God can live with joy and peace because we have a certain hope that God will protect and bless those who love his name. In Psalm 5, King David provides an example of what believers can pray for when we face malicious and dangerous enemies. We should pray for guidance, justice, and blessing. We live in a world where we are saturated with propaganda. We are inundated with information and images that promote ungodliness. We are constantly sifting through lies and misinformation and we need to be thinking. We need to protect our minds and hearts and we need God to lead us in the right path. This is why we need to pray for guidance. We need to ask God to show us the path of righteousness and lead us through it. Remember Romans 12 verse 2, Paul writes, do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. We must be on guard, brothers and sisters, and be intentional about what we allow to influence our minds. The messages of the world come from different sources, media, schools, government, institution, organizations, and also people in our lives. We are fooling ourselves if we think we can take in the messages of the world and not be influenced by them. We are naive if we think that the culture of this world is ineffective in changing our thoughts and manipulating our feelings. Take an inventory on how you spend your time. What and who are you listening to, watching and reading? Evaluate whether you are being guided by the Spirit of God or by the Spirit of this world. As a specific word of warning about our technological age and media that surrounds us each and every moment of the day, what you see, hear, and read in the media is likely created and designed specifically to arouse your emotion and manipulate you to buy something, believe something, or behave in a certain way. So be mindful of this, brothers and sisters. Be alert and of sober mind. The Bible tells us your enemy, the devil, provides uh, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. As we travel through a hostile and desolate land, we need the Lord to be our guide. This world is not our home, brothers, sisters. We are passing through it on our way to a promised land. Resist and stand firm in the faith. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Be led by the truth of the Word of God and the power of the Holy Spirit. So let's pray for guidance, but also pray for justice. The greatest injustice has not been suffered by man. The greatest injustice has been committed by man unto God. Let me say that once more. 
The greatest injustice has not been suffered by man. In fact, the greatest injustice has, com has been committed by man onto God. We must look at justice through the perspective of a holy God. When we do this, we will pray that God may judge the wicked for his name's sake, for his glory, because he alone is worthy. We should pray like David for justice. Bring justice on the wicked, dear Father, not because of what has been done to me, but because of the multitude of transgressions you have endured and continue to endure day by day. You alone are worthy and holy, O God. And Jesus taught his disciples to pray like this. Holy is your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So what about believers? Do they continue? Um, do they not continue to sin? Well, will they not also be condemned if they're sinning? Well, we have all rebelled against the Holy God. We are all guilty of sinning and transgressing against God. Let me say that again. We are all guilty. We all deserve death. But although we are guilty and deserving of death and destruction, Followers of Jesus have been forgiven and cleansed of their guilt and given the righteousness of Jesus to be accepted by God. And this grace and forgiveness is extended to anyone, anyone that turns to Jesus for mercy and life. Anyone. It doesn't matter where you're from. It doesn't matter what religion you're from. This, is, this grace that God has given to us through Jesus is extended to you. The righteousness of Jesus Christ has been imparted to a believer through faith in Jesus. This righteousness is given through faith in Jesus Christ to all who believe, as we read in Romans 3, um, verse 22. Yet there will still be many who refuse to turn away from their sin and turn to Jesus for life. They will continue to transgress against God and pay no mind to the evil they commit. Out of their mouths they will shout, Let us break their chains and free ourselves from slavery to God. On the other hand, David writes that the righteous take refuge in God and love his name. But let all who take refuge in you rejoice, he writes. Let them ever sing for joy and spread your protection over them, that those who love your name may exalt in you. Therefore, there are two key identifiers that mark a righteous person. The first is that the righteous take refuge in God. Taking refuge in God means trusting God or putting your faith in Him and submitting to His rule. The second, the righteous love the name of God. To love the name of God means to love God for who He is. John Piper put it well when he said, this is the essence of what it means to love God, to be satisfied in Him. Not just His gifts, but God Himself as the glorious person that he is, loving God will include obeying all his commands. It will include believing all his word. It will include thanking him for all his gifts. The essence of loving God is admiring and enjoying all that he is. The righteous are those who put their faith in God and love him for who he is. So again, like David in times of adversity, Believers must pray for guidance, justice, and finally, blessing. David affirms that God blesses the righteous and covers them with favor as with a shield. Verse 12, For you bless the righteous, O Lord, you cover him with favor as with a shield. Don't be shy to ask for God's blessing and favor. In fact, the righteous who put their faith in Jesus are already blessed by God. Ephesians um, we can read in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 3, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. That's like winning the lottery, brothers and sisters. That should make us smile. And so, in summary, when we look at Psalm 5, it teaches us that God has the greatest, number one, God has the greatest authority and he can help us. So we should call out to him and wait for his reply. Number two, 
Those who trust in God are accepted by God and declared righteous because of God's steadfast love. And number three, therefore, the righteous should pray and ask God for guidance to be led through the path of righteousness, justice, so God may judge the world for his namesake, for his glory, because he alone is worthy, and blessing, because those who put their faith in Jesus are already blessed by God. If you are listening and it is evident to you that you are living your life without God, maybe living for yourself or for others, then think about the destruction that awaits those who do not follow God, who do not walk in righteousness, in the path of righteousness. You do not need to carry that heavy burden of sin and death any longer. There is salvation and a refuge for you. You need to turn to Jesus. You can confess your sins and follow him and Jesus will take care of you. He will be your refuge. He alone can cleanse you and make you righteous so that by faith in him, you will be accepted by God. Through the abundance of God's steadfast love shown to us in the death and resurrection of Jesus, we can be accepted into God's house and we will be blessed and called righteous. Let's pray, brothers and sisters. Heavenly Father, we turn to you, we cry out to you because you have all authority in heaven and on earth. O oh Lord Jesus, you are holy and we confess our sins and we thank you that you have imparted righteousness onto those who put their trust and faith in you and follow you. Guide us in your righteousness, bless us, for our blessing is great and we hope for the promised land as you lead us to it. We praise your name, holy God. Amen. Hey family, join us from wherever you are in seeing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Brothers and sisters, thank you again and friends for joining us today. I trust that the Lord took His word and spoke to you through His servant. And I pray that you would respond in all the ways that God is moving you to respond through the Holy Spirit. And so even as we do that, I want to leave you with a doxology, which we find in 2, Timothy, 2 Thessalonians 3.16. And uh, we read this way. Now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times, in every way. The Lord be with you all. God bless you, and we hope to see you again soon. Thank you.